Good morning, family. Happy Mother's Day. Let's pray. Almighty God of all creation, the one who brings forth life, God, our parent, our mother, our father, sustainer of all that is good and right. God, we pause in this moment to simply pray that we trust you. So whatever it is that we need, whatever it is that your world needs, whatever it is that creation needs, Almighty God, we are praying and believing even without seeing and knowing that you are granting it right here, right now. We trust you and we give you thanks for the ways you are at work. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our passage of scripture today comes from Judges chapter 13. It's a bit lengthy, but I think it will serve us well as we honor mothers today. Judges 13, I'm reading from the New International Version, and it reads as follows, starting at verse 2. A certain man of Zorah named Manoah from the clan of the Danites had a wife who was sterile or barren and remained childless. An angel of the Lord appeared to her and said, you are barren and childless, but you are going to conceive and have a son. Now see to it that you drink no wine or other fermented drink and that you do not eat anything unclean because you will conceive and give birth to a son. No razor may be used on his head because the boy is to be a Nazarite set apart to God from birth. And he will begin the deliverance of Israel from the hands of the Philistines. Then the woman went to her husband and told him, a man of God came to see me. He looked like an angel of God, very awesome. I didn't ask him where he came from and he didn't tell me his name, but he said to me, you will conceive and give birth to a son. Now then drink no wine or other fermented drink and do not eat anything unclean because the boy will be a Nazarite of God from birth until the day of his death. Then Manoah prayed to the Lord, O Lord, I beg you, let the man of God you sent to us come again and teach us how to bring up the boy who is to be born. God heard Manoah and the angel of God came again to the woman while she was out in the field. But her husband Manoah was not with her. The woman hurried to tell her husband, he's here, the man who appeared to me the other day. Manoah got up and followed his wife. And when he came to the man, he said, are you the one who talked to my wife? I am, he said. So Manoah asked him, when your words are fulfilled, what is to be the rule for the boy's life and work? The angel of the Lord answered, your wife must do all that I have told her. She must not eat anything that comes from the grapevine, nor drink any wine or other fermented drink, nor eat anything unclean. She must do everything I have commanded her. Manoah said to the angel of the Lord, we would like you to stay until we prepare a young goat for you. And the angel of the Lord replied, even though you detain me, I will not eat any of your food. But if you prepare a burnt offering, offer it to the Lord. Manoah did not realize that it was the angel of the Lord. Then Manoah inquired of the angel of the Lord, what is your name so that we may honor you when your word comes true? And he replied, why do you ask my name? It is beyond understanding. Then Manoah took a young goat together with the grain offering and sacrificed it on the rock to the Lord. The Lord did an amazing thing while Manoah and his wife watched. As the flame blazed up from the altar toward heaven, the angel of the Lord ascended in the flame. Seeing this, Manoah and his wife fell with their faces to the ground. When the angel of the Lord did not show himself again to Manoah and his wife, Manoah realized that it was the angel of the Lord. We are doomed to die, he said to his wife. We have seen God. But his wife answered, if the Lord had meant to kill us, He would not have accepted a burnt offering and grain offering from our hands, nor shown us all these things, or now told us this. The woman gave birth to a boy and named him Samson. He grew and the Lord blessed him. 
So today we're going to talk for a brief time about the mother or mothering is of. Mothering is of. So there are many things to be named before we dig in today. So just bear with me for just a moment. One, I want to name that we hold with one another the multitude of experiences we have as it relates to the human experience of being or desiring to be a biological mother. We hold together the multitude of grief and joy that surfaces in moments like this around loss, the absence of, or even the beauty of being in relationship with our mothers. We hold together all the complex emotions while opening ourselves to the intentions and ideals of mothering that transcend our own experiences. We invite how God may be speaking right here, right now. Now with that said, for those of you who may not be accustomed to a few baselines that I operate from, one, I need you to know, for all of us to be created in the image of God, God must have both masculine and feminine qualities. Two, gender is a limitation of humanity and God is not bound by gender. Therefore, God can be both mother, father, and more broadly, parent to us as needed. And then third, the feminine, is in part a reflection of the image of God as mother, the one who brings forth life, is the origin of life, who births and sustains life. So regardless of whether or not you are a biological mother, we all have access to the divine feminine as an expression of life giving and sustaining action. But finally, the church embodies the feminine as we are the bride of Christ. We collectively in all our individual gender identities are called to the mothering of humanity that births life and sustains it in the lives of those around us. All right, let's dig in. The preposition of, O-F, expresses the relationship between a part and a whole, as in a piece of the whole pie, the sleeve of the whole shirt. Have you ever considered how difficult it would be if the preposition of was no longer a part of our vocabulary? If we were unable to express the ways we relate to um, parts of a greater whole, the part and whole are not the same. A piece of the pie is not the whole pie. It is part of the pie. We are of many things that make up our nature. I am of a people who farmed land and sharecropped. I am of a race that has redefined what resilience is. I am of a faith whose savior is birthed, who is um, both fully human and fully divine. I am of Lucy Palmer Turner Slade and Isabel Brown Coltrane, my grandmothers. I am of Percy Coltrane and McAllister Mango, my grandfathers. I am of Henry Donald Coltrane, my father, and Veronica Mangum Coltrane, my mother. I am of the world and the universe, the soil and the cosmos, mortality and eternity. I am all these things and people without being fully these things and people. Our look at mothering today is steeped in this place of the ways in which mothering is of certain attributes of God without being God. Samson is one of the more well-known judges in Israel's history, coming along when the Israelites were under the tyrannical rule of the Philistines. Samson was unique from other judges in that he was not a high ruler or military leader like many of those before him, but a son of the tribe of Dan. He was chosen as part of God's plan to once again deliver God's people from oppressive rule. Our account today, though, does not focus on Samson as he has not yet been born nor conceived for that matter. Today, we will journey through the coming of his birth with his mother. There was a certain man of the tribe of Dan whose name was Manoah. He had a wife who was barren or sterile. And one day an angel appeared to her and says, although you are barren, you shall conceive and bear a son and he will be a Nazarite, one dedicated and set apart for the service of God. Three things marked the covenant of a Nazarite. They could not drink strong drink, nor eat anything unclean. They could not cut their hair, and they could not have contact with the dead. 
The angel directs her to observe these things as Samson's mother, despite the fact that she herself was not to be a Nazarite. She goes and tells her husband Manoah that a man of God has visited her. She recalled he was like an angel. I did not ask where he came from, nor did he share his name, but he told me I would bear a Nazarite son and that I am to abstain from strong drink and eating anything unclean. Manoah, also having had dreams of being a parent, desires to share in the experience and wants specific direction from God on how they are to raise this Nazarite, Nazarite child. He prays for God to send the man again, and God listens. The man returns again to Manoah's wife as she sat in a field. In my mind, the open space of the field reflects the open space she had within her to encounter God, however God chose to appear. She runs to get Manoah and he comes to engage the angel of the Lord. Manoah asks him, what is it that Samson will do? The reply refocuses again on his wife. Let the woman heed and observe as I have directed her. Then Manoah extends hospitality, asking him to stay and eat. The angel declines and says they may make a sacrifice to God on the altar if they wish. Manoah, not recognizing that this is an angel of the Lord, asks, what is your name? So we may honor you once our son is born. The angel responds, why is it that you ask my name? It is too wonderful for you to comprehend beyond your understanding. Manoah makes the sacrifice to the Lord and the angel of the Lord ascended in the flame of the altar. Manoah finally realizing the divine presence falls with his wife, their faces to the ground. Manoah is filled with fear and says, we will surely die for we have seen God. But his wife says, if the Lord had meant to kill us, he would not have accepted our offerings, nor shown or announced these things to us. She bore a son and named him Samson. So I invite you to journey with me as we look at how God might be extending to us as women and mothers and more broadly as the bride of Christ, the church, a broadened understanding of what the action of mothering is of will mean. That mothering is of the qualities, particularly of God, specifically, that mothering proceeds from and that therefore is a part of, in the hopes of illuminating ways that we may live into these parts of ourselves as women and the church, and in like fashion, we will explore three. First, mothering is of love. No big surprise here, but the way it manifests in this passage is quite unique. As we know, the United States of America has a very twisted and incestuous relationship with the claim to own human beings. The most egregious form, of course, being enslavement. But within the hierarchy of privilege, women were, the, were in the past considered property of their husbands. Women, namely white women, as black and indigenous women were not considered human but often chattel, did not have legal existence apart from their husbands. This historical premise began long before the first colonizers and oppressors hit the indigenous shores we now call the Americas. But it is a history that lingers even now in the lagging laws surrounding rape culture and women being able to make decisions about their bodies in equal pay and so forth. And so when I read and reread and read again this passage, I was quite stumped by the fact that the angel of God continued to appear to Manoah's wife and not Manoah. In fact, even after Manoah specifically prays to encounter the man who came to his wife, the angel still appears to her. Why? Well, one quite poignant point of the account is that the angel's message is for her. Manoah is certainly impacted by it, but it is her body that will carry the child. He says to her, you shall conceive. I can recall preaching um, at a church during one of my pregnancies and the pastor mentioned that Dedrick and I were pregnant, to which I said, no, we are both expecting a child, but I'm the one that's pregnant. Trust me, 
Got the mama's body to prove it. All right. But then he says to her, not only will you conceive this angel, but you must refrain from strong drink, wine and unclean food because your son will be a Nazarite. And here we might glimpse it. Perhaps this angel appears consistently to her because she is the one who must choose her body and her choice. She must choose to accept the restrictions of the covenant being made, must choose to perform acts of sacrificial love before her child is even born. No one can choose that for her. The choice she makes is of love, active love. And in the Old Testament, there is a connection between love and covenant. One scholar says that Yahweh or God's love initiates and sustains the covenant that begins with the commandment to love the Lord your God with what? Your whole self. To love God is life itself. It is life to you and length of days. The irony of this account is that Samson's mother was entering into covenant with God on his behalf. But in doing so, she was committing to sacrificing in the ways necessary for him to have access to true life and extended life. Y'all, this is reframing for us a way to hold love. Like, what if we view love itself as a covenant? Desmond Tutu says that love is more binding than law. If love is a covenant, then it must be chosen. For love to be and covenant to be, one must choose it. Perhaps this is the strongest argument we have for why free will exists. Love is why we were created, but love can't be love unless we can choose it. And when love is chosen, it can be so sweet. A few weeks ago, I ordered a coffee at a drive-thru, and when I pulled up to the cashier, I was told that the person in front of me had paid for my order. Now, this was simply an act of kindness by a stranger who by, the will, by their will chose to bless me, and it was so sweet. Consider what it means for God, who is love, to love us because God wants to, chooses to, not out of obligation, not because God has to, but desires to. I am suggesting that mothering is of the love that is God. Mothering chooses acts of love that will give those in our care the best possible opportunity to live life into the fullest and whole. There's no guarantee because we're all living in a broken world, but we are doing the best we can to offer that opportunity. Where in your life do you need to remember that God, our mother, is choosing to love you? Where do you need to choose to love yourself or others better? How can we as the church lean into the mothering love of God? How can we choose to love people differently? Second, mothering is of wonder. Wonder, a cause of astonishment or admiration. Astonishment at something awesomely mysterious or new to one's experience. When I was a child, my parents decided to dig underneath our carport to make an open garage and closed in porch. But there was an incident where the carport caved in on the men who were working and everyone was able to get out except one. And after what felt like minutes, but was probably more like seconds, the final man emerged from the dust. Relieved, the other men asked him if he was okay. And he said, yeah. He said, thank you to whoever pulled me out. And they told them, nobody out here pulled you out. The man reported that he felt someone grab him and push him out. Who was it? An angel? God? His imagination? A ghost? All we know for sure is that he made it out safe. We were astonished at something so awesomely mysterious. On a daily basis, the wonder and amazement of the way God made us in all creation is something I don't believe we give enough time and energy to. Now, there are many accounts of God opening the wounds of the barren or granting conception to those who could not conceive. But the language here seems unique to me. The angel of God comes to this woman and says to her, you are barren, present tense. Some translations say, although you are barren, or indeed you are barren. At any rate, he declares her barren right then. Although you are barren and have no children, you shall conceive. 
Y'all, after reading this for about the fifth or sixth time, I felt the wonder and amazement wash over me. Not that God opening a womb isn't amazing. It is. Not that in vitro is an amazing science. It is. I am a firm believer that much of our natural way of life is in the realm of the supernatural and extraordinary. But here this angel implies that she will conceive in spite of her barrenness. In spite of means without being affected by the particular factor mentioned. I got chills, y'all, because there is so much about this world and our lives that is barren, and the barrenness seems to be unchanging and unmoving. In fact, sometimes barrenness seems to be the only thing we can rely on. But here we see through the life of this mother that even when natural law is unmoving, natural, supernatural law can stand in defiance. This is about the things we can't understand. This is about the things we don't know, the stuff we can't figure out. This is about the limitations of our minds and bodies. This mother is of wonder because the mystery surrounding her conception demands us to acknowledge that faith means accepting that some experiences are simply beyond our comprehension. Mothering is of a wonder that presses us to believe without seeing that every time we pray, for a miracle, we are drawing on the wonder of mothering. Every time we believe, despite what's before us, we are feeding off the wonder of mothering. Every time we pray the same prayer again and again and again, we are declaring the wonder of mothering. We are saying, God, amaze us. God, astonish us. God, bring forth your mystery and life within us. Although you are barren, although you are unable to produce life on your own, life will still be brought forth through you. Barrenness is where we believe there is no capacity for life. What parts of your life are so barren that you find it hard to believe God can work in spite of that barrenness? What parts of the world need the church's mothering prayers of wonder? Where is the wonder of mothering beckoning you to keep choosing to love. Mothering is a wonder. Finally, mothering is of wisdom. I believe we can see the blending of both wonder and love in this point about wisdom. The Hebrew word for wisdom is a feminine noun meaning sound, efficient, understanding. It is to succeed and to be able to counsel others in success. Generally, it is understood to be both something we as humans can possess while simultaneously existing above and beyond us, existing ideally with God. Some suggest that wisdom is what imparts or forms and shapes creation. I've also heard it described as knowledge, human capacity, plus discernment, God capacity. Many of us at least have one memory of calling for or desiring our mothers or mother-like figure, grandmothers, aunties, etc., in a moment of fear and uncertainty. I have listened to countless accounts of what it felt like for folk to hug their mamas or their grandmamas after over a year of being apart in the pandemic. Mothering, no matter who gives that to you, brings a comfort and reassuring that seems to dispel fears. This is what made the cries of George Floyd so chilling. But we see the mothering of wisdom at work in our mother today before she even becomes a biological mother. Again, proof, at least for me, that mothering supersedes our limited purview. Once the angel of God ascends through the flame on the altar, Manoah realizes that he was in the presence of someone who was not human. He believes they have seen God and as expected for the beliefs of his time is afraid that they will die because they saw God. It was believed that to gaze upon God was too much for a human to withstand. But his wife and her mothering ways speaks wisdom with clarity and confidence saying, if the Lord had meant to kill us, he would, have, he would not have accepted our offerings or shown and announced to us all these things. This may simply seem like common sense, but y'all, it was a well ingrained belief that to see God was to die. 
This was lived. Um, this was a lived experience. Um, this was lived experience and divine discernment spoken to dispel his fear of dying. And it is not God's, and is not God's perfect love that which casts out fear. Her wisdom is used as a portal for love. But further, from the outset, this mother seems to understand some things that Manoah must catch up to. Now, I'm not suggesting that this is true simply because she's a woman. Many of the wise people in my life are men, but I am stretching us to see wisdom as the work of mothering in the world. OK, meaning that no matter who accesses wisdom, they are accessing a mothering quality of God. Even in Proverbs, we see the feminine personification of wisdom. Proverbs 1, 20 says out of the open or out in the open, wisdom calls aloud. She raises her voice in the public square. Manoah did not know this mysterious man was a messenger of the Lord. But his wife's first account to him was, a man of God came to me and his appearance was like that of an angel of God, most awesome or awe-inspiring. Then she says, I did not ask him where he came from and he did not tell me his name, which implies that she did not ask his name. Y'all, this is actually a bigger deal than we may realize. Notice after the angel appears a second time to this mother, while out in the open field, Mano Manoah comes and does, in fact, ask him his name, which the angel declines to answer. Names are of great importance in scripture. During this time, to know a being's name was to know them intimately, to know their personality. And some suggest it was believed that to know a being's name was to be able to access their power. We see this here, and we see it in passages like the one where Jacob wrestles with the angel, asks his name, but never gets an answer. When Manoah asks of the angel's name, he replies by questioning his intention. Why do you want to know? And then he points to the nature of his name as wonderful, beyond understanding. Could it be? Could it be that Manoah's wife not only discerned the identity of this being, but knew enough knowledge and discernment, had enough wisdom to know when to simply experience and receive, to be in the wonder of the moment without needing access to the power of the one creating the moment. She could receive divine blessing and bask in it. Where might wisdom be calling you to simply invite and enjoy a divine visitation without overthinking it. Her wisdom is used as a portal to wonder, but there's a little bit more here. There are many women in the Bible who had children after being unable to and were named in the Bible, Rachel, Rebecca, Elizabeth, Sarah, and so forth. Samson's mother joins this list of women, yet her name is not included in the account. It is not odd for women's experiences to be named in scripture without they themselves being named, but usually they are women whom the recorders or society of the text and time might deem as not worthy of being named. The woman with the issue of blood, the Samaritan woman, the Syrophoenician woman, etc. And often in the OT, we see women named more often, even if they are viewed as less central, but not here. Then I realized she was not the only one unnamed in the passage. The angel of God was also not named. Is it irony that Manoah's wife is strangely and suspiciously unnamed in this passage, just like the angel of the Lord is unnamed? Now, I'm not suggesting that she was an angel. But I am suggesting that perhaps the lack of this woman's name was intended to bring the honor her mothering nature requires. And if so, then could this passage stand as a premise to bestow that honor upon every unnamed woman? Honor bestowed upon those fighting for the right to live a whole life. Honor bestowed upon every unnamed woman pressing despite the barrenness of invis invisibility to bring life to those around her. Honor bestowed upon every woman choosing to love when it would be so much easier 
to hate. The wonder of God shows up again in her wisdom, in her unnaming. Perhaps this is also a testament to the reality that mothering, be it individually or as the church, has a mysterious part to its nature something beyond our ability to articulate and fully comprehend, but yet we are able to access it and exist in it as we bring forth life. Mothering, y'all, is of God. May the wonder and wisdom of God, our mother, root deep into the places of barrenness within us and bring forth the power we need to choose love. Mothering is of, so it is, and so it shall be, Ashe. Sure.